Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Facts on the Ground. I am Misty Winston, joined uh, by my co-host, Jesse Zerwell. Um, and today we have a very special guest. Um, I'm super excited to have him on and talk to him. He's a, a very interesting person, um, uh, is a lifelong organizer and activist, uh, uh, activist uh, was a civil rights lawyer, and challenged the one and only Nancy Pelosi, who my husband calls the devil, um, in California's 12th District, um, uh, managed to force half a dozen policy concessions and um, was actually her strongest contender um, really in, in probably forever uh, and got 80,000 80, votes, which is incredibly impressive in Nancy Pelosi's district because she has a stranglehold there. Um, so today we are very, very, very happy to welcome Shahid. Shahid? Shahid see? Girl, yeah. We just talked yeah. about this. No, but I got Shahid nervous. Bu yes. Shahid Buttar. Yes, but I got nervous. Here's what I do. I get nervous and then I can't talk. That's what happened. Our audience hey, is used I to it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I've messed up plenty of names. Yeah. So. No, our audience is used to it. They know who I am. <laughs> Anyways, I thank am you for joining us. No yeah. No thank you for joining us. Good, sir. We appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, the reason why um, you're here actually is because I had tweeted out, I'm um, obviously a very strong Julian Assange supporter. Um, and I had tweeted out that if you're a candidate running for office and you refuse to speak for Julian Assange, I will actively work against you. And I mean that. Um, and so you tweeted at me and said, hey, would you be willing to speak to candidates who do actually speak about Julian Assange? And I'm always open to that. Um, so that's why we wanted to have you on. Um, and you also have a very interesting history um, in terms terms of um, kind of the free speech. You've been with EFF, um, things like that. Um, so just for our audience who may not be familiar with uh, who you are and kind of your background, can you just talk briefly about, you know, how you got to um, the point where you were then challenging Nancy Pelosi <laughs> in California's 12th district? Sure. Thank you, Misty. I'm an immigrant and I come from a country where the racial minority and the religious minority that I'm from was oppressed by a military dictatorship supported by the U.S. So I am a child of the military industrial complex. <clears throat> I, my family moved to Missouri when I was two. I had a chance to later study and teach law at Stanford. And I was in law school at the precise time that many people locate the beginning of our constitutional crisis. I'm thinking about the terror attacks of 2001. And I frankly would locate it many years before that, maybe even 70 years before that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have a run amok executive branch. We have a military industrial complex that was forecast by its architect to threaten democracy in America. And as a, maybe I'd put it this way, as a, as a socialist, I am very left-wing and I am frankly more constitutional than I am political, which is to say, while I am a voice from the left challenging capital, I am equally a voice from the people challenging the executive branch run amok of the United States. And I'm very conscious of the oath of office, which uh, everyone in Congress swears to follow. And it includes an oath to defend the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And most of them frankly don't understand the constitution enough to even recognize the domestic threats. And it is the domestic threats to our constitution that frankly forced me to run for office because I saw my voice in Congress for the entire time I've been a San Franciscan, backing the executive branch, reinforcing executive secrecy, covering up torture, enabling surveillance, looking the other way on detention, facilitating and contributing to mass incarceration, while then ironically kneeling in kente cloth, claiming to stand for civil rights reforms many years later, I see the rise of a bipartisan authoritarianism and it's not a new phenomenon to me. A lot of people became concerned about authoritarianism after Donald Trump won the White House in 2016. Mm -hmm. I've been concerned about fascism in the United States since the Bush versus Gore decision. Right. And you know, it's it's not very hard to uh, to see if you're under the boot as a Muslim immigrant. It reveals itself painfully clearly, and <clears throat> I'm glad that many people have the privileges that enable them to overlook that dynamic. But I can't. And I'm particularly concerned about defending not just the rights of vulnerable minorities, but the constitution of the United States. I'm, I'm an immigrant defending America from itself, ultimately. And that's why I ran against Pelosi. And that's why I defend Julian Assange, because press freedom matters and the public's right to know matters. And many Americans have forgotten the importance of these principles, but they're, they're not lost on me. Right. And so you said the genesis of sorts for you getting into the activism and 
political work that you've done was were the, was the 9-11 attacks, correct? At least as it relates to civil liberties, I mean, just to rewind the tape a little bit more. So before I went to law school, I'd worked uh, in Chicago for a series of investment banks. It's how I paid for night school. So I went to undergrad, mostly at community colleges, while working for a series of investment banks doing financial analysis and designing presentation graphics. And I saw then in the 90s, the creation of the derivatives that ultimately would crash the economy in 2008. Mm -hmm. So when I went to law school, my original aim was to study antitrust law, and I did. I was invited to join the Justice Department in the antitrust division in 2001, and they shut it down entirely. And so antitrust enforcement hasn't been visible in the last 20 years. While I was studying how to restrain capital, this other thing emerged in the form of a constitutional crisis that, you know, frankly preceded it, but I wasn't as aware of it then. Uh, and then it, it revealed itself. So it really did determine the course of my later career. It wasn't necessarily the thing that got me into activism, though, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, that makes total That's sense. That's what I was just trying to clarify. Um, I think a lot of people are un... I don't know if they just don't understand or if they're unclear. Um, but a lot of people, I, I when I'm, you know, trying to discuss Julian Assange with them, aren't aware of how great the impact will be if Julian Assange is allowed to be extradited. Um, this is something that I struggle with trying to make people understand how serious it is. I just can't seem to find the words. Um, but this is, a, a lot of people don't understand that this will be the first time that a journalist will ever be indicted under the Espionage Act. And right. um, it, it really is uh, mm -hmm. kind of a turning point for us as a country, um, as a society. It really is one of those things where it's gonna go one of two ways. Um, can you speak a little bit to the fact, just given your background, um, the danger that you see inherent with uh, the prosecution of Julian Assange? Absolutely. We have been prosecuting whistleblowers as spies for entirely too long. Julian Assange is the first publisher that we are subjecting to prosecution as if he was an espionage agent. And it's incredibly illegitimate in the first instance to target whistleblowers that way. And just to be clear, whistleblowers like Edward Snowden or Chelsea Manning are government employees who witness horrific things and feel compelled to come forward to let the public know what they, from their privileged positions, have seen. And it's not the rights of whistleblowers that are undermined when the executive branch retaliates and prosecutes them or drives them into international exile or tortures them as they have to Chelsea. It's the public, we the people of the United States are the people harmed when the executive branch suppresses democratic transparency. We fought a revolution over this many years ago. The right for the people to, to own and drive and control the government. We are supposed to have a government for, of, and by the people. When the press or whistleblowers are suppressed, that commitment becomes completely meaningless because we can't claim to have a government for, of, and by the people who don't know what our government is doing. Now, when we think about press freedom and Julius Assange, it's like standing between mirrors because it gets even, it's more intense than that. Among the things that Julian Assange revealed many years ago, I think it's almost 10 years to the day of the revelation of the collateral murder video. Actually, it was just on Monday. There you go. So we're- 11 know, years incredibly poignant anniversary and to think about what that video just in itself setting aside everything else that WikiLeaks and Julian Assange have put out there just thinking about that video alone we're talking about the assassination of journalists that the U.S. military tried to cover up and when a publisher published the video we're now prosecuting that publisher the idea that the press the free press can survive the legal regime that Julian Assange's prosecution would create is a fantasy. This is the gateway to losing whatever vestige of a so-called free press we have. And, you know, I don't want to laud our media establishment because frankly, it's appalling. Terrible. Yes. Right. And it would get worse. At the moment already, journalists reduce themselves in too many cases to stenography, you know, basically transcribing government officials' comments and reporting them as if they're facts, even when they're not. I was arrested in the U.S. Senate asking questions, 2015, asking questions about lies revealed by whistleblowers, namely Edward Snowden, that executive officials got away with, they got away with the lies. James Clapper not only lied in public under oath about a matter of grave constitutional importance, this is the NSA warrantless wiretapping scheme that was flatly illegal when it was created under the Bush administration, he has a pension 
And if we're going to be prosecuting people, why are we prosecuting publishers who reveal government abuses instead of the government officials responsible for those abuses? They are the people we should be prosecuting. The entire leadership of the CIA should be in prison. And if the United States recognized the jurisdiction of, interna of the International Criminal Court, they probably would be. Mm -hmm. But that's precisely why we don't recognize the jurisdiction of international bodies because we know that we harbor war criminals. We promoted one to the head of the CIA. And I find that absolutely appalling for a country. There's that one that's president right now. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it's, it's not unfair. You're absolutely right. There's never been a war for plunder uh, that Joe Biden hasn't supported. Well, I mean, that that's, that's he yeah. is old, but he's not that old. Right. There hasn't been a war for plunder in the last 50 years that he hasn't supported. Right. Uh, yeah, but I think what you're saying uh, about the ICC and the U.S. is really important because at the Nuremberg trials, Justice Robert Jackson said that the Allied powers, which had won World War II, must take great concern. I'm I'm not quoting. I'm paraphrasing to also apply the Nuremberg the Nuremberg laws and international law, uh, international laws and treaties uh, to themselves and. We haven't seen that since uh, the Nuremberg trials. Um, the UK, the US, they've never held themselves or any of their major players responsible for the seemingly endless litany of war crimes and crimes against humanity they've committed. So people need to remember that, that there was warning early on that if we don't hold ourselves by the same standards, then things are quickly going to uh, unravel. And I think that's what we've been seeing uh, since 1945. No question. For sure. I'm so glad that you raised the Nuremberg trials because that's a critical history here. People forget that the reason we have international human rights is because we won the Second World War and we have effectively now lost it to ourselves without a bullet being fired. It is preposterous. The, the historical arc here, the abdication of, of a victory that we should be proud of and, and the critical legal principle that was established at the Nuremberg trials, which we sent a Supreme Court justice to prosecute, Robert Jackson, the central legal principle is strict liability for torture. What that means is that if you torture someone, you are guilty of an international crime. Full stop. It doesn't matter who gave you the order. It doesn't matter if you thought there was a time bomb ticking. It doesn't matter what exigency or emergency you imagined. If you torture people, you are guilty, period. That's why... Many people in the intelligence apparatus in the U.S. can't travel abroad because they are at risk for being rightfully detained and prosecuted in literally every country on this planet except for ours. And I find this, this is a really disturbing thing for people to grapple with who haven't understood the history of U.S. foreign policy. But since the Second World War, all we have done is force resource extraction for corporate interests across the global south and it's not an invisible hand extracting those resources. It is an iron fist, and it's called the CIA. Mm -hmm. And there have been dozens of coups, uh, democratically elected governments that have been toppled because it suited the interests of Wall Street. We used to make a habit, no joke here, this is literally true. We made a habit repeatedly, dozens of instances of invading Latin American countries to steal their fruit mm -hmm. and then sell it to American consumers. And this history is absolutely crucial to understand, particularly for America's left today, because many people, I fear, who have embraced socialism in the last five years, think of it strictly through the lens of labor and the interest of fighting domestic capital. But you can't be a meaningfully committed socialist without understanding the American imperial project, because it's not just the people of the US that are being abused by Wall Street. This is a global resource extraction machine. And we are the only people in the world who theoretically even have any control over the apparatus. That's why I'm running, uh, why I ran for Congress and why I'm contemplating uh, running again, because we, the people of the United States, have to get a grip on our government. And this isn't just true with respect to human rights. I want to bring this full circle to the climate crisis. The reason we have a climate crisis in the world today is particularly because of the resource extraction machine I was just describing, the wars for plunder, the wars for oil, not only seize oil so that we can burn it, but they also spend and expend oil in order to, to conquer places. Right. And this, this use of fossil fuels for the purpose of extracting more, it's, it's kind of like a Ponzi scheme. 
And unfortunately, the future is going to have to pay the price. And the only way we're going to get on the other side of the climate crisis, yes, we need a Green New Deal. Absolutely. And there's a lot of things we could say about renewable energy, but we can't claim that that's enough. We can't pretend that that's enough because as long as the Pentagon is off its leash to run amok around the world and take petroleum from under any indigenous people it might find, we are going to continue hurtling off a cliff. And I'm, I'm eager to prevent that. And I'm really happy that you brought this aspect up because it's been really frustrating for me over the past four or five years, watching people who claim to be leftist or claim to be socialists, um, who do not at all pay attention to foreign policy. They do not at all care about imperialism. It's not something they think about. It's not something. And I understand that a great reason for that is because the United States populace is incredibly propagandized. Um, they're not shown the horrors of war anymore. They learn their lesson after Vietnam. We don't see caskets coming home we don't see the ramifications or we don't you know we might see the bombs taking off so that brian williams can have his fun on air um, but we don't see them when they land we don't and see quote, the devastation and quote leonard, leonard cohen, cohen. He does oh so. so gross but there we the american populace doesn't get to see the ramifications of war very often we used to i mean we used to have journalists embedded like they would be on the ground um you know really reporting um but we don't have that anymore and so i understand that a, a large part of it is because people are blue fully unaware of what's happening, but it is also very frustrating because I feel like if you're going to be um, someone who identifies as leftist or as a socialist, you should take it upon yourself to become informed on those issues. Um, is that something that you, I mean, you just briefly kind of mentioned that it is something that you've seen too. Um, what oh, do you yeah. make of that? Because I kind of see it, it th those are the two things for me over the past five years that have been very frustrating is watching the left concede the issue of free speech to the right and mm. watching the left um, just completely forget about war and imperialism and uh, all of that. Um, and so what do you make of that? Because to me, it's been really frustrating to witness. Real talk. I, I think to some extent we could ascribe this to a failure of, and I don't want to say it's the left because I don't think it is the left. It's people who claim it without understanding it. But many new socialists, I think, are, struggle to understand what intersectionality means. Intersectionality when we think of it through the lens of the liberatory vision, is the commitment to address any form of marginalization. And many new socialists are driven to an awareness of socialism because they feel marginalized, not recognizing their own relative privileges as compared to others. If you have a US passport, it generally means, unless you're Anwar al-Awlaki or his 16-year-old you know, son who we vaporized with a drone based on his father's speech in spite of a legal process, it most In the vast majority of cases, if you have a U.S. passport, you're not going to find yourself on the other end of a barrel of a gun held by a U.S. service member. That's a privilege most people don't have. And we in the U.S., even working class people who are being fleeced relentlessly by Wall Street, have to recognize our relative privileges, a privilege of citizenship, if nothing else. I think there is an awareness in some many pockets of the left, particularly about the challenges facing undocumented immigrants. And undocumented immigrants are frankly preyed upon viciously by both parties used as political punching bags to create authoritarian powers that are then rolled out across the entire populace. That's how we got a national biometric tracking scheme. And it, it came through the FBI, but they used immigrants and DHS as the wedge to normalize it. So I see immigrants being used as the gateway to a broader fascism. Many of the same leftists who recognize the plight of immigrants fail to extend the analysis to people who haven't yet come here. Many undocumented immigrants, particularly people along the Southern border in the humanitarian crisis that's been unfolding there for years, they are driven to migrate by some combination of climate crisis. And we've described how we're particularly responsible for that human rights abuses in which we often have a hand or domestic violence across Latin America, often related to narco trafficking, which we've also had a hand because that's what the CIA was doing in the 1990s. And, you know, it's, it's painful to reflect upon some of this because the ignorance of the American public is the only thing that enables these abuses to continue and compound. And the, just to, I'm gonna to try to do another connection here. In the 90s, when the CIA was running crack cocaine into LA and Miami, People forget how that related to the U.S. And so in the last year, so many of us, so many people on the left have been in the streets saying their names because after the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor or go back before that to Eric Garner or Mike Brown 
Amadou Diallo, I could go on, you know, this is not a new phenomenon. It's been 400 years of arbitrarily murdering innocent black people. And torturing them. I don't know if you remember the case of Abner Louima in New York City. Absolutely. Or for that, I mean, George Floyd illustrates that too. I mean, he yeah. was killed in slow motion. Yep. Uh, on tape. And will anyone go to prison for it? I don't know. We'll find out, right? But right. It, it, it's, it's striking with Eric Garner that the only person who went to prison when that was captured was Ramsey Orta, who filmed it. Again, an attack on the right of the public the, to know mm -hmm. what is happening under our feet. But just to connect the dots here, so all the leftists who've been in the street for the last year responding to the arbitrary murders of our black neighbors, yes, it is a 400 year project. It's gotten particularly pernicious though in the last 30 years. What happened in the last 30 years? The paramilitarization of US police. Why did they paramilitarize? Because narco traffickers started killing cops in LA and Miami. Why did narco traffickers start killing cops in LA and Miami? Because they were funded and trained by the CIA. So instead of doing anything about the CIA's crimes, what did we do? We just threw millions of black people in prison where they are now subject to legal slavery. It is absolutely appalling. The fascism of the US is well-established and expansive. And the point here, you know, as you think about the, you were asking about the willingness of so many people on the left to overlook its international tentacles. It is because we obsess on the part of the empire that is in our face. And we forget the parts that are further beyond. But unless we under act with an understanding of the totality of what we are combating, we will inevitably be led around by the nose. That's the story of the left in the United States over the last three generations. And I frankly uh, am very eager to see us get over that. You know, it's one reason why I'm very excited to see voices that, that challenge those abdications, that still recognize the importance of free speech to the left, that remember COINTELPRO, for instance, and also remember this history, you know, Misty, when you were talking about Vietnam and the loss of embedded reporters. You know, the, the embedded reporters in Iraq were all, were all embedded with Pentagon units, yeah. you know, whereas in Vietnam, you were actually getting independent press. Uh, and, and, and this historical decline, not just of transparency, not just of human rights or peace, but particularly, I would call this the loss of democracy, because if we don't know what our government is doing, we can't claim to be driving the ship. That's and, very and, close to a Julian Assange quote. Um, you know, you have to start with the truth. If you don't start with the truth, then bad decisions are made. I'm paraphrasing. I'm probably butchering it terribly. But um, I'm glad that you said that the, that the fascism of the United States is so appalling, because I also wanted to make it clear to people that fascism did not come with Donald Trump. It's been right. here. It's been here for a very long time. I actually, I think I watched a TED talk that you gave like four years ago. And I think you spoke about this a little bit um, that, you know, the fascism has been here for some time. Um, it's really been, I, I mean, I like to say it's been decades in the making, but really over the past 10 or 15 years, um, it's really ramped up the attacks on the press, the attacks on free speech, the attacks on civil liberties. And I mean, the Patriot Act and all of those things have really just, it's a massive snowball rolling down a hill at a hundred miles an hour. And I don't know how to stop it. Um, and then we have elected progressives cheering on things like censorship, um, which has become very frustrating and very sad. It's very depressing to watch somebody like an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez um, not only cheer for censorship, but um, demand more of it. Like in Congress, she's out there telling Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg that he should be uh, you know, allowing Facebook to censor more people. And that's very scary to me. Well, that is um, what he's doing. Well, yeah, but I just, to me, that's scary that somebody who is claiming to be progressive is advocating for something so authoritarian. Um, is that something that you see as being a problem um, for a, I hate calling it like a leftist movement. I'm really kind of over the left, right nonsense. It's really, to me, it's the people. It's the people, whatever you happen to believe in, it, we're all going to have to rise up together, um, yeah. you know, to deal with the real problem. But um, do Can you find that- to, Before I that? get into the first piece? Oh, yeah, 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 well, yeah, 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 go. The tail end of your question alluded to something really profound, and I'll come back to the first piece around yeah, sure. you know, AOC and Zuckerberg, but just that idea of we're all one people and we have to rise up together. There is- and Assange is an example. He, he brings together an interesting transpartisan consensus because there are many people on both the left and the right who recognize that. In Assange circles, we call it postpartisan, sir. <laughs> I'm with it. Postpartisan, transpartisan. It's people is the point. It's not partisan. It's, it's right. And, and it's, it's, 
it's important to recognize because it speaks to this constitutional layer I was talking about that sort of transcends politics. You know, we divide over any number of things, but at the level of wanting a democracy that is accountable to we, the people of the United States, that's a transpartisan consensus across the United States. And it's interesting that so many libertarians and socialists or progressives or people in between the, you know, those, those spectrums come to these issues because they share an understanding of democracy. Again, this kind of, I, come, I keep coming back to that as a central theme because it's implicated in press freedom. It's implicated in this post-partisan uh, notion. It's implicated also in this deference of political actors to secrecy. Now, with respect to Zuckerberg or Facebook and corporate content moderation, I've been silenced myself repeatedly by online platforms. YouTube in particular comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And this is a story that again, is like standing between mirrors. It was about a year ago, almost. Uh, I don't know whether it did the day or not, but sometime in the spring last year, uh, do you know the independent journalist in New York, Walker Bragman? Yes. Yeah. So we were doing an interview talking about the then impending reauthorization of the Patriot Act by Nancy Pelosi. So government surveillance powers, it did not get reported on in the press. We're talking about it in an independent media interview and YouTube deleted the video within minutes of it being posted online. Hmm. So we're talking now about corporate censorship, reinforcing official censorship to keep secret unconstitutional abuses. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I laugh about it because it's hard, frankly, to find another outlet. You know, as a brown person, you don't really have the right to get mad in this country without being shot. I'll be so mad for you. <laughs> I appreciate it. And, you know, we, there's a great deal of anger that is appropriate here. And, and, and it's appropriate to draw it expansively because this is not a GOP problem. And this is what you were getting at with the first part of your question. And I so appreciate it. Many Democrats are up to their necks in whether it's supporting surveillance or calling for corporate content moderation, both of them threaten the public's right to know in similar ways, whether it's supporting the prosecution of journalists or whistleblowers, both of which suppress the public's right to know. People in Washington, particularly in Congress, what is Congress? It's the people's representatives. It as a branch is supposed to be existentially committed to our interests. It's why they're there. They're there to fight the executive branch. It's how it's written in the constitution. The branches are supposed to contend against each other. The, in the Federalist Papers, number 10, Madison sort of lays this out most explicitly. And what has Congress done? They swear their oath of office to defend the constitution against domestic enemies. And then they you know, leave no stone unturned in their efforts to reinforce and support executive aggrandizement secrecy, the wars, right? Nancy Pelosi has funded every war over the last 20 years. And that's how, how are our representatives in Congress going along with this? And it's, you know, that brings us back again to democracy because I would say our elections are not particularly democratic. That's a whole other thing we could chase. I wanna respect your question though, just on the corporate content moderation piece specifically to narrow the focus there. There's a, a lot of misconstruction in that debate and confusion. First piece just to note here is that because they're private platforms under the existing legal framework, those companies are at liberty to do whatever the hell they want. They can silence anyone, they can censor anyone, they can pick and choose, lean on the scale, and they do dramatically. And there's nothing we can do about it because there's no law to stop them. Now, the, what people are concerned about is the fact that they lean, when they lean on the scale, they do it heavily. That's an antitrust problem. And this takes me back to you know, our conversation about 20 minutes ago. I, the reason I studied antitrust law was to keep businesses from getting too big to fail or getting so big that they can swing elections or getting so big that they can suppress voices or twist the truth. Uh, and, and this is an area where we need to see Congress challenging the position of the tech companies, not just their parameters in terms of how they govern content. Another piece to note here is that corporate content moderation, the decision by corporate platforms to suspend accounts or remove content is inherently anti-democratic and it's always going to be arbitrary. When people say, oh, you have to pull down that terrorist content, what happened? Evidence of human rights abuses started getting taken off YouTube where now Human Rights Watch can't get it anymore, right? When people said, oh, we're gonna uh, you know, take offline ads that relate to human trafficking, what happened then? People who engage in voluntary sex work were placed at physical risk because they had to put themselves back on the street instead of vetting clients online. Mm -hmm. Whenever we engage in this exercise of suppressing speech, people get hurt. 
And, and that's an important point to recognize here no one in Congress should be inviting anybody in Silicon Valley to suppress anything. It's a profound misunderstanding of the values at stake, the history, the future risks, the demonstrated harms that have already happened in this sordid endeavor. And I'm eager to make sure that we guard speech, not just in the constitutional sense, but also online. And the key to guarding speech online is aggressive antitrust enforcement. I could chase a bunch of rabbits in terms of how to make that happen, but I'll shut up at that. So, no, I agree. <clears throat> you mentioned, you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you mentioned a profound misunderstanding on the part of Congress as to what's going on here. And I completely agree with you on that. And I think nothing illuminated that better than, I forget which congressman it was, but he asked uh, Mark Zuckerberg when he was testifying before Congress how Facebook makes its money, not knowing that Facebook makes its money through advertising. And selling and, data. <laughs> and selling data, absolutely. And we're supposed to trust these people who've been mired in this... Uh, congressional apparatus for so long who don't understand. Well, they're also, and this isn't ageist, don't come for me. No, I'm, but I'm they're not, like I'm not. 70, 80 years old, and we're asking them to understand Facebook, you know? That's right. Hard. But my point about them being there for so long is that they've been there for so long, too long, and it feels like a system that's entrenched. And at this point, hopelessly unchangeable that's how i feel and so my question to you is what why do you think it's still uh an appropriate or an effective means to to go through congress to run for congress to try to change the system from within as the cliche goes fair question frankly i'm committed to it because it's the only democratic alternative i don't see another way around it the only way to stop the next war is to do it through congress there's no other mechanism to restrain the pentagon basically right i i understand what you're saying but when you have biden unilaterally deciding to strike syria without any congressional approval and that's just a and common... that's not the first time that's happened that presidents do that all the time trump did it it's there there right. really is no congressional there they have completely abdicated their power they've given up it's they there's no accountability or you know oversight or anything it's just presidents do what they want um, you all remember mike Ravel, the yes. senator god i love right. him yes right and i do too and his people forget like they they like him a lot for his tweets and the videos mike Ravel. I like him for Pentagon Papers. <laughs> right. Same here. And I was just going to tell that story. Why don't you actually, because I keep talking. Do you want to just explain? No, no, no. You, no, you're our guest. People get, hear me all the time. Trust <laughs> me. They don't want to hear me talk more. <laughs> all the time I hear myself. So, you know, Mike Ravel helped end the Vietnam War as a member, not of the House, but of the Senate. And the way he did it was by leveraging his privilege as a member of Congress to read classified secrets into the congressional record. He revealed to the public the secret military hidden history of how the Vietnam War started. And it was not the Gulf of Tonkin. He revealed that we started it in the same way that Edward Snowden revealed that we weren't minding our international commitments or our own domestic constitutional commitments either. In the same way that Chelsea Manning revealed that we were assassinating journalists with the help of Julian Assange, who we're now prosecuting, right? Um, I, uh, I went and forgot the question. Can you just uh, ground me again if you'd be so uh, No, just, I think, okay, because Jesse, Jesse and I do not believe in electoral politics as a way to affect change in any way. We've already seen, um, you know, there was this whole push for the squad. We're going to elect the squad and then they're going to go in there and they're going to stand up to the democratic establishment. Um, that was the whole point of them. They came out of the Bernie movement. The Bernie movement had just been royally screwed over and these right. people were going to go in and they were going to challenge Nancy Pelosi. They were going to go in there and flip some tables and make things happen and instead they've completely capitulated they're calling her mama bear um all they talk about is how terrible republicans are never hold their own party accountable um they're not really pushing for any of the platform um ideas that they proclaim to stand for they gave up on medicare for all when they had an opportunity to push for it they gave up on 15 dollars an hour when they had the opportunity to push for it um and so what is the point um, of continuing to elect or work towards electing or supporting financially or uh, phone banking or, I mean, I phone bank for mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders. I volunteered for Bernie Sanders. Yeah, I canvassed for Bernie you. Sanders. I donated a shit ton of money to Bernie Sanders that I wish I could have back now. Um, so I just don't understand at this point um, 
after all that we've seen over the past four years, what is the like, what is the point? And we're asking this because we don't believe in electoral politics. Um, but I'm also yeah, it's it, not it's not supposed to we're not meaning to attack you. No, or, it's not or, like or, a confrontational or, thing. anything. No, yeah, not at all. Our, our, I, I our have great respect for your work. I am a, a fan of your activism and all of that stuff. Just for me personally, I don't believe in electoral politics anymore. I don't think totally. it's been effective in any way at affecting any change. We're worse off. Um, so yeah, I'm just like, we always like to ask, we, I mean, we interview, um, other candidates and we always like to ask what, what do you see as, um, you know, what good can come from that for you? Right. I think your criticisms of the squad make a great deal of sense. And I understand why people have grown disillusioned in the recent past. I have a longer time frame to reflect upon. And I'm, you know, it's not just the last four years I've been active. I've seen, you know, Russ Feingold when he was in the Senate, voted against the Patriot Act and did what he could as a lone voice to stop the train. I've seen members of Congress, not recently, but I've seen them stand up. Mike Gravel comes to mind. They're rare. And I do get lumped in with the squad a lot because I'm a person of color and I'm coming from the left. But you know, I've been 20 years, I've been fighting the executive branch. That's not true for most of them, right? right? <clears throat> and this is a place where I think we have to be sophisticated enough to parse and distinguish among different voices. One of the challenges, and this is, I'm gonna, I do wanna address your question squarely. So let me just start there. I, I wanna get back in a minute to the Medicare for all, um, force the vote moment, because there's a challenge within the squad and the progressive caucus that frankly impeded any attempt to assert. Um, but the long story short, I just go back to my first answer. The, the reason I'm, Actually, I want to take this in a couple of different places. First, in some respects, relative to your question, I feel like I'm moving backward relative to the rest of the country because I was over electoral politics 20 years ago. People have been asking me to run for something for 20 years, and I've always said it's a racket. Why would I do that? That's why I organized direct action. It's why I was a policy advocate. It's why I'm a political artist. It's why I organized other artists, because electoral politics is far from the genesis of social change. It's like the ninth inning of a baseball game. You have to play the first eight innings first before you get to the end. Electoral politics is how successful social movements translate their momentum into formal, juridical, legal influence. And part of the challenge is that the squad, you know, sort of represents something of a vanguard. They're, they aren't necessarily uh, backed by transpartisan majorities across the United States. Now, Medicare for all is, that's a policy that is backed by post-partisan, to use the word, majorities across the United States. And yet we don't see the bill moving forward. Why is that? That gets to the corporate co-optation of Congress. And you, you actually nailed it, Misty, when you set up the question. I think we sent them there to fight Pelosi. Now, none of them have fought Pelosi. I fought Pelosi. And, and I'm particularly curious how they might show up if she's not there. Remember when Ilhan Omar got attacked for being anti-Semitic and it was Nancy Pelosi opening the door and holding it open for Trump to attack members of her own caucus, right? Remember when Ocasio-Cortez decided not to try to force the vote, voted for Pelosi to serve as speaker and still got denied a committee assignment. Pelosi just rubbing it in, who's boss around here? People blame the squad for being under a bus, but they forget who's driving it. The person driving the bus has a name. It starts with Nancy and it ends in Pelosi. That's where we should focus our opprobrium, not on the people who, frankly, who lack the, I think, influence to stand up to her. Now, when we, just to drill down on that, at the force the vote moment, there were enough votes at the margin to force a vote if there was cohesion across the squad and the progressive caucus. But people forget that Ayanna Presley is not in the same place as Ilhan Omar by a long shot, right? Cori Bush has done things as an activist that no one else in Congress has. Like, and, and I do think of Corey and Ilhan as sort of the closest things to my voice who are in Congress now. And they do go to the mat. You know, Ilhan proposed sometimes. the bill. To, sometimes. And sometimes they don't. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, all, all I mean to say here is that, you know, from the standpoint of a single vote in the House of Representatives, I think they do about as much as they conceivably could. I would love to see them get access to some whistleblowers and start reading their reports into the congressional record. That's something I would be very eager to do. I think it's why I got smeared because the executive branch and the establishment in Washington know how much a threat voices like mine pose to the establishment. And I think it's, you know, I see the smears that Ilhan gets subjected to every day. I mean, the lies that get spread about her are legion. And, you know, Corey 
probably will face it if she hasn't already. You know, having talked to her before, she faced a lot of smears before she went to Congress. And I see this pattern of the establishment punching down and left. You can't take that off the table when evaluating the way the squad shows up in Congress. As it expands- Well, okay, I have to push back on that a little bit, bit because uh-huh. yes, I can. Um, mostly because they, they, th- that's what they said they were going to do. So don't tell people, hey, come work for me, come vote for me. I'm going to be your voice. I'm going to fight back. We're going to go in there. We're going to raise a ruckus. That was AOC's words. We're going to raise a ruckus. We're going to bring the ruckus to the Democratic Party. And they haven't at all. It's not even like they have a little bit. They haven't at all. The fact that we were even having a conversation that progressives were going to vote for Nancy Pelosi was bizarre to me. That shouldn't have, no, you, no, you don't vote for Nancy Pelosi, really, as a progressive. To me, that's um, a no brainer. It's, and it, 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 it is a no brainer. I want to meet you there because yes. they got nothing for it. They no. voted for her and got nothing for it. No, that was bad. In policy. fact, they, they went backwards. She got taken out of her committees and they got right. smeared. And so, you're, what are you get? what are you doing? What have you done and- for the people and it, and it reflects how it reflects how uh what happened to bernie sanders after he was railroaded in 2016 uh schumer gave him some you know also director ran, of outreach yeah some also ran position and yes. we've seen it before mm-hmm. we have seen it before and all, all i can say is that i think with more votes and people who come from deeper backgrounds of actually organizing Uh, And and I don't mean in any way to diminish people in the squad because many of them have very substantial backgrounds. You know, Jamal was a principal. uh, Corey was a nurse. um, You know, uh, Rashida had had served. And Corey was an activist. Like she was, she comes straight from activism. So, I mean. That's why I particularly relate to her. Yeah. Also because she represents the congressional district where I graduated from high school. And just to make this clear, I left Missouri I went to Chicago. I spent about 10 years there getting my undergrad degree. When I came to California, it was something of, I felt like a political refugee from the Midwest. And the idea that as a San Franciscan, I watched St. Louis get a voice to the left of the rest of Congress before San Francisco, it is frankly shameful to the mm-hmm. entire West Coast that Los Angeles doesn't have a voice in the squad. Seattle doesn't have a voice in the squad. Like, where are our most progressive cities? And it, this speaks to, frankly, the co-optation of progressive districts by incumbents. And this is one of the reasons why these patterns continue, because the squad doesn't have enough backup. Most people in Congress don't go there to fight the executive branch, don't go there even claiming to want to raise a ruckus. They just go there to promote their careers or whatever industry promotes, you know, bankrolls them. And, and they're just there to to fill a seat. I, when you say that they haven't done anything, I want to push back there. I want to just offer maybe a couple examples, right? And all of this is historical. And I, I want to just note here that I'm not aiming to defend the squad. I'm just aiming to, in the spirit of transparency, reveal, you know, what is. So we can- Yeah, let's bring out all the facts. You know, when AOC, her first thing she did in Congress was a sit-in at Nancy Pelosi's office about the Green New Deal. You know, why did she ever retreat from that position? I don't know, but that's exactly what we need members of Congress doing is forcing long overdue debates. And I, I frankly thought that was a great thing to do. I thought I was proud of her for that. The and the sit-in way was she, great. Her interview following the sit-in was really gross. Praising me, Nancy Pelosi as coming from a position of, or a space of activism and being an, uh, interested in civic engagement. That's bullshit. She knows it, it was gross. But yes, the I sit-in was fine. Her. Yeah. Well, and in fact, what you just described is the subject of my pinned tweet is me addressing AOC saying, in fact, Pelosi is none of the things that you gave her credit for. But ultimately, I think that was, she was trying to extend a fig leaf, you know, like, if you're such an activist and organizer, Nancy, you can show up anytime. And of course, because she is not, she never did. Right. And unfortunately, the squad has shifted how they relate to her from being in opposition to now being in some sort of weird alliance that I can't can't defend and don't understand. So I'm, I'm going to meet you there in the disappointment in their voices that way. But just again, to stay with this track of things they have done, the articulation, at least of the vision of the Green New Deal, was a massive event in U.S. politics. I frankly think, and granted, it's not a policy yet, it's not even a formal proposal yet, but the fact that it's been the object of discussion helped along by a voice in Congress, that's a massive leap forward from where we were before because no one was even discussing serious responses to the climate crisis until then. 
I would feel if better I, if, if she can... would give credit to the Green Party because she never gives I... credit to the Green Party who invented the Green New Deal. She never talks about Howie Hawkins. And I'm no Howie Hawkins fan at all, but he deserves credit for that. And she never talks about the Green Party or their involvement in that policy. And she's also really watered it down and corporatized it in some ways, yep. um, which is- fossil fuels in the ground, which yeah. is super important. Doesn't so... mention fracking. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, it's a problem for me. But it's the, a problem for me. But, but, but the fact that that action- uh, the Green New Deal action, so to speak, which is, uh, Shahid, as you said, it's really not even gotten its wings yet, let alone off the ground. Yeah. It, how do I word this? It, that, 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 that is considered a big leap forward that we have to consider that a big leap forward is problematic in and of itself. Sure, and absolutely. I, I don't think there's enough time for, there's for not. the dilly-dallying. That's my problem, as as honestly, goes. Shahid. That's my problem with the electoral politics. And you're saying, well, they just don't have enough votes. We got to get a couple more people in there. We don't have time for that. People are dying. Yeah. We that's don't have time. That's not actually what I'm saying. It's, it's not getting more people in there. I was saying we have to do everything else first. You know, I, I only come to electoral politics after having done direct action and mutual aid and policy advocacy. We have to do those things too. A lot mm -hmm. of people focused on electoral politics and they took their eye off the ball. They forgot that you have to do all these other things too. And they expected a handful of voices who've established a beachhead in our legislature to be able to do something without the rest of the process being in place. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying that we can't defer to the squad. We have to force them into not showing up, because I think they show up. I, I want to make this last point about Ilhan before, because I, I kind of skipped this. Ilhan's introduced some very visionary bills, and any leftist should, should be, frankly, excited about a proposal to force banks to pay the cost of housing during the pandemic. It has never once come up for a hearing in Congress, probably because House Democrats are led by a wealthy landlord. Again, named Nancy Pelosi, just to bring it all <laughs> right. full circle. Again, right? But I see them doing, what can you do as a member of Congress? Oversight and legislate. When Elliot Abrams came before Congress, what did Ilhan do? She flayed him. She did. I'll right? give her credit for that. She absolutely flayed him and it was beautiful. I was, you know, it was a moment where I, you know, the, the political equivalent of, 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 of like uh, being infatuated with someone, like seeing her, leverage the oversight context that way to hold account people who are very comfortable and complacent in their ongoing abuses of human rights. That was inspiring to me. Yeah. She, I, I, I particularly, and I tweeted in defense of her on that and also in defense of her when she was being called an anti-Semite. Anti yeah. Um, I did but I, I particularly, particularly liked how she pushed Abrams on whether he was charged of a crime or not which he right. was, and then he was pardoned. But he was too proud with that- Stupid, that smug Mr. smile. That Mr. Burns nose of his to admit that he was charged of basically war, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And he's only sitting there in his suit speaking to her because he was pardoned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it really, it really got his, his it really stoked his ire, you could tell, and I think really exposed what a disgusting man he is, what an inhuman man he is, and mm -hmm. he deserves to be like Henry Kissinger. Um, oh. Just don't oh, get me started about Kissinger. I God. know. Yeah. <laughs> Hated. <laughs> yeah, the, the way Misty, your husband, describes Nancy Pelosi might be my perspective towards Henry Kissinger. But you know, if, frankly, if everybody in the squad was Ilhan Omar, they would have shown up very differently over the last year. Part of what you're disappointed in is that many of them don't have that kind of commitment to go to the mat. They get lumped in together for marketing purposes, but they don't vote as a block. There's not right. I've always found it very weird. You mentioned Ayanna Presley being very, she, I mean, she was a Hillary Clinton supporter. She trashed Bernie in 2016. She was a Warren supporter. She's not really a progressive. I know progressive gets thrown around a lot and it really has lost all meaning, but I mean, Elizabeth Warren's not progressive to me. Bernie Sanders is maybe progressive. Like he's in any other country, he would be like center to center, right? <laughs> um, it, he's that's not right. that left. And um, so it's, it, that's kind of been a problem too, is that there's been this weird, um, 
um, identity thing where people think that Bernie is left. And so they have now labeled themselves as leftists, but they have no idea what left is. Right. Um, so that's a problem too. There's a lot of misuse of terms and uh, people are misidentifying themselves when they should just be saying, I'm a you know, hipster liberal who is fine with <laughs> imperialism and just wants healthcare, you know, like that's yes. it. Well, um, ooh, that's so poignant. Well, the way you, I guess you're, you know, sarcasm started us. There you go. Yeah. The, <laughs> There's yeah. definitely something there. I think you're onto with respect to how we care. Oh, just go to Brooklyn. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> but on, on the subject of where Bernie's at on this spectrum, I, I do think of these things as nationally relative in mm -hmm. the sense that he might not be a leftist as compared to the international spectrum. But when we assess him relative to the American spectrum, he's frankly done more, I think, than any person in the last 50 years to inspire Americans to think beyond the limits of our current moment. And, you know, the that's absolutely fair. And I'm very hard on him, but that is absolutely fair. He really has um, gotten a lot of people paying attention who otherwise would not have been. Um, it was really fun to actually experience. Like I said, I supported Bernie Sanders in 2016. I went to a rally and I volunteered with people and I, a lot of people had never been involved with politics before, had never been involved in activism before, had never, you know, phone banked or canvassed or any of those things. And I had never been involved in electoral politics before because prior to, I voted for Obama in 2008, hate myself for it now. Um, I voted green in 2012. I voted for Bernie in 2016 and then voted green. And then I did not vote in 2020 and I will never vote again um, until the system is until we've completely dismantled this system because I don't think it's effective in any way. Um, I'll vote for local issues. I'll go if there's like ballot yeah. initiatives or local candidates for school board or things like that. I think you can make a difference there, but I'm yeah, not voting yeah. for president. Yeah. Um, I was just going to go there. That democracy and voting is a lot more than the presidency. I mean, yes. presidency is, I don't want to say it's meaningless because obviously it matters it kind a of lot. Is. <laughs> But, right, it kind of is. You know, like <laughs> the school board, the water board, your city councils, that's where democracy really inheres. Like that's, and frankly, those people are hyper empowered relative to their congressional counterparts. As a member of Congress, you don't have, frankly, any power at all. You have one vote in 430. And it's in a body with enumerated powers that is effectively undercut at every opportunity by the executive branch, as well as state legislature. So you know, Congress is not a powerful place. It can be in concert, but this gets back to, I want to finish that point about Ayanna Presley. Just now when you were describing her background as being frankly, much more towards the moderate center than many of her other counterparts with whom she gets lumped in, you might be describing quite specifically why force the vote couldn't happen because they don't vote as a block. If they were all Ilhan, I don't think Pelosi would be the Speaker of the House anymore. And I mean, I can't, that's a counterfactual, I can't prove it, but I certainly know that I can go to Congress and be a voice more like Ilhan's and less like, say, Ayanna's or people who stand to her right. It's important here to extend the arc too, and let's just think back to the Congressional Black Caucus. This happened before when we were describing, you know, they were gonna go in there and create a ruckus and then they got co-opted. That is the pattern. That's what the Democratic Party does. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what happened to the civil rights leaders who went to Congress, John Conyers. Think about Clyburn and his role in putting Biden in office, right? I mean, crucial influence used to promote the center against our communities. <clears throat> and so that's, not to promote the crime bill guy. Look, so, and, so. And, and looking outside of Congress um, a little bit, look how Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition or Al Sharpton have been co-opted. I mean, mm -hmm. I know they show up at events for that. Have they to often do with... get booed out of those places, though. Yes, they are not honest actors, in my opinion. Maybe they were at one time, but Shahid, how do you, I know you can't insure it because nothing's sure, but as far as you, if you are elected into Congress, how will you resist being co-opted into that, the system we currently have? Thank you. And I do think that that's, that's a, that, thank you for raising that. One, for me, I'm not interested in power. I never have been. I've walked away from money twice. I left investment banking to go to law school and I left corporate law firms to join nonprofits. I am only in this, frankly, to liberate. That is my goal. That is sort of my raison d'etre. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of that is about inclination. Another piece of this is just about who you're beholden to. You know, the, ultimately I answer to activists. They're the ones who are putting me there. That's why Corey is showing up differently than the others. You know, when, you, when your base comes from the ground and people who themselves are marginalized, 
it's, it would be shameful to go with the establishment. And I know it, I know who put me on the field, you know, it's people who are contributing like $10 a piece, right? I, I don't have any corporate backing. I don't answer to those people and I don't have aspirations. This is a key part too. You know, my only aspiration is to defend a whistleblower and force some executive branch official to get fired, maybe prosecuted. That's my aspiration. I have no aspirations around my own voice. And I think that maybe is an allure for many people in those positions because they get dangled carrots in front of them. Another piece here, you know, one way I aim not only to resist that dynamic, but actually change the dynamic is by removing the principal enforcer of corporate centrism from the House of Representatives. Nancy Pelosi isn't just the Speaker of the House. She isn't just a 30-year incumbent who's ducked debates since the Reagan administration, who was born with a silver spoon in her mouth and creating a family dynasty. She's not just a mama bear who strikes left and punches down. Well, that's where I was going to get at. She, and she, she's in power now, thanks to a backroom deal. That's exactly right. As a, as a Democratic Party fundraiser, she was handpicked to basically succeed the life of a uh, story congressperson who had died a few years before, uh, Phil and then Sal Burton. And, you know, Pelosi, since she went to Congress in 1987, has never debated an opponent. And she is construed in the public as a figure entirely different than her actual record would suggest. And she gets away with this. This gets back to our so-called free press and how good a job it does exposing, you know, to the public what our government, in this case, the incumbent politicians are doing. If we take her out of Congress, I think the game actually shifts because she turns screws. You saw this in the denial of the committee assignment to AOC. Now, would someone else become the speaker? Sure. Would they be inclined to run Congress like a mob boss? Probably not. Well, and they wouldn't have as much power. I mean, she's been, it's ingrained. Like she has been there for so long. She controls all the buttons, all the levers she has. I mean, the donors are all in her, like she's in their pocket. They're in her pocket. Like it's, it's a very incestuous, corrupt environment. And she's like the mama bear of it. So removing her while yes, somebody else will be the speaker. And that person will probably be corrupt because people in Congress are corrupt. Um, but they're not Nancy Pelosi. And she is a special kind of corrupt. And I think that that alone, um, just by the, alone having somebody who is going to be entering that position and then having to build up that level of power, that at least gives us some time <laughs> where right. we can try to make some pushes in Congress. Right. I think, I think the critique that you all are you know, raising of the electoral system is totally legitimate. I would describe it as circumstantial and not inherent. And, and this gets back to who the people are. Right? I do think that there are certain crucial positions. The Senate Majority Leader is one. The Speaker of the House is another. If you change who is in those positions, it can shift the game. Now, of course, there are any number of centrists who line up behind her, but just to, you know, to your point, Misty, they're not going to have Nancy Pelosi's juice. They're not going to have the effectiveness uh, that she's been able to promote. And I mean the effectiveness here, not in promoting the interests of we, the people of the United States, but her effectiveness as a defender of Wall Street and the Pentagon to insulate them from popular accountability. That is a thing that she's become masterful at. She's described as a master legislator. She is a masterful protector of an establishment and a co-opter of people who, you know, many of her supporters would like to think that they support families, that they support working people, they would like to think that that's what she's doing. Oh, she's fighting Trump, right? She tore up a speech. She's funding his concentration camps and expanding yeah. his surveillance powers and now goes to Biden. And how is that going to go? I mean, I think the same pattern is going to happen there. The most authoritarian aspects of the Biden administration are going to find full-throated support from Nancy Pelosi. And on the areas where you see, and this is worth getting specific about, police reform is one and democracy reform is another. There are two bills around which Democrats have been very vocal, HR1 and the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And I wanna be uh, clear about this. I think both of those measures are generally good, but each of them have poison pills in them. Mm -hmm. HR1 would dramatically escalate the burdens facing third and minor parties in seeking ballot access. And before, when you were talking about the Green New Deal, I share your uh, concern about crediting the Green Party where it emerged. I was a registered member of the DC statehood Green Party for the better part of 10 years. So I, that is my political home is the Green Party. Um, the, uh, now I went and distracted myself. Um, mm, just talking about HR1? Yes, thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. The poison pills that, that, that increase the obstacles to ballot access. 
um, are anti-democratic. So there's an expansion of voting rights in a lot of really important ways alongside a contraction of democracy in other disturbing ways. Similarly, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act includes some elements that I've spent 20 years trying to get Nancy Pelosi to support. Like for instance, the data- Excuse me all, I have to help the, uh, oh, you got her? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Shoot. We, our bathroom door is janky, so. Oh. She's five <laughs> and has trouble figuring it out sometimes. As five-year-olds do. <laughs> Can somebody please help me? <laughs> <laughs> So cute. Anyways, continue. The George Floyd um, right. policing bill. Right. This is the bill that Nancy Pelosi donned kente cloth to kneel in Congress and then at the press conference forgot George Floyd's name as she's introducing the bill that would, again, include some positive elements. And one example of that, something I've for 20 years advocated for that Nancy Pelosi has never supported until last year, was a requirement for police agencies to collect data about the demographics of people that they stop, use force upon, arrest, basically data that would enable people to prove profiling. At mm -hmm. the moment, there's no data. Again, the public's right to know is undermined because nobody collects the information. Um, and so that's a, a positive piece of the Justice and Policing Act. It would also curtail qualified immunity. I proposed that in 2018. And I'm glad to see Nancy Pelosi finally show up for that now. But the bill would also expand police budgets Mm -hmm. and surveillance, exactly what millions of people have been in the street over the last year arguing against. So why do we end up getting these bills that nod at progressive interests, future regarding interests, at the same time that they embed these horribly regressive establishment defending principles? That's this how they get passed. The <laughs> there you go. They get and, their and terrible also, things passed by throwing glitter in your face. Look how pretty. And also there, there's, there's money to be made from that for weapons corporations, yep. for uh, corporations that manufacture black jackets, body or cameras, body cameras all uh, rubber bullets. Um, and a lot of those corporations are in congressional uh, constituencies, if you will, or, or regions. And yep. <laughs> the Congress people who represent those regions are, uh, basically in fealty to those, those companies, whether it be Lockheed, Raytheon, you name it. And, you know, that's a big reason why the war machine keeps going and why we see, I think, you know, not just more militarized policing, but as you were just talking about with the bill, this sort of speaking out of both sides of the mouth. Uh, so really nothing is, there's no reform, if you, if you want to use that word, uh, really nothing gets done. And I think just to this point, uh, anybody who's, who's interested should read Alex Vitale's book called The End of Policing because yeah, it, gets to, it gets to a lot of this and it's, um, it's just so uh, urgent for our times. To, and also to because that, he won't do it, watch Jesse's interview with him from early on when the show first started because he won't tell you to do yeah, it. Yeah, he was one of my early guests when I was, yeah, yeah awesome. when I was, before Misty and I teamed up. Uh, he was one of my early guests and he was really great to talk to. Yeah, awesome. it's a good interview. Everybody him. should check that out. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think that this really just goes along with, um, like we were talking earlier, you cannot separate foreign policy from domestic policy. And that is right. that is true still for the police brutality and the military brutality that we see. I mean, our our cops are trained by IDF. Um, you know, it's it's very much an intertwined issue. I mean, they get their uh, weapons. I don't even know. I don't know what police department needs a tank or a... <laughs> Well, the, well, the, uh, the carrier or a rocket launcher for us. right. It's the, I mean, the defense department sells them used equipment at yeah. Bargain prices. I know it's ridiculous. I went to an Ohio State football game and they're out there like rolling around in a tank. Ohio State like campus police and I'm like, listen, I know Ohio State fans can get a little rowdy, but this is ridiculous. Like you don't that need was this. military recruiting is what that was. Yes. That was the, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a big prop. I mean, all sports activities are propaganda extravaganzas. <laughs> Pretty gross. On, on this militarization piece, just to put this out there. So uh, 11 years ago, I guess it was 12 years ago, I uh, took over the leadership of a nonprofit at the invitation of its board of directors called the Bill of Rights Defense Committee. It's now known as Defending Rights and Dissent. And I sit on the board of that organization. But when I was leading the Bill of Rights Defense Committee, we synthesized 
a local legislative reform platform that basically aimed, among other things, to end profiling and specifically to end the militarization of police. So I've been on this for a decade and I watched Obama facilitate the further militarization of police. He, he had an executive order that very much at the margins restricted what police could get. It was like treaded tanks wouldn't be available, but that's not what they give to police anyway. It's mine resistant armor plated vehicles. They don't have treads. So similar example, you know, not at the progressive interest, but create the hole in the bucket so that the reality remains unimpeded. This is a bipartisan problem and it's not new. Just before Jesse, when you were describing the way that the industries are located in key congressional districts, I wanna go back, I referenced this earlier briefly, Eisenhower speech, the last public address given by the US president who was the supreme allied commander of the victorious forces in the second world war that created this international human rights regime, which he incidentally violated himself at points. But this legacy of the speech in 1961, he described a military industrial, the first version of the speech included congressional complex. That dynamic you're describing was revealed by the architect on national television at the birth of the medium when everyone was watching, fast forward 60 years and somehow an entire country forgot. Mm -hmm. And we elected a bunch of people to Congress who never heard or listened in the first damn place. Yeah. I, I wrote a chapter in Project Censored's 2017 volume about- I read that, you sent that to me, thank you. That was well written, thank you for that. I appreciate it, thank you for checking it out. Yeah. Now, I just. That, that same set of concerns is what's dry, what, what drove me to run for Congress because I've seen the political branches fail at every opportunity to protect human rights and civil rights from this resource extraction machine. I wanna make one part really explicit too, and this might get really disturbing. When we talk about that resource extraction machine in the international context, we might be talking about oil or these days maybe lithium. Right to complicate it. For and solar domestic, panels, especially, right? and cell phone batteries. Mm -hmm. This And this might relate to the coup in Bolivia and who was behind that, which we don't know. I have my suspicions. Um, but you know, it, it not only relates in the international context to natural resources, in the domestic context, we're talking about human resources, mm -hmm. right? Slavery remains legal in the United States, in prisons. Mass incarceration is a forced labor program. No one will say it, but we're talking about mass industrial slavery in the United States. There are more people in prison today than were enslaved at the height of the antebellum slavery institution. So what does that mean? What it basically means is that slavery got multiracialized, right? That's, that's the difference now is there are also white and Latino people who are enslaved right. alongside African-Americans. And Native convicted. Americans. Native Americans Absolutely. are yeah, imprisoned at a high Absolutely. rate. It's pretty terrible. Absolutely. Yes. Leonard Peltier. And you mentioned um, that it was it, 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 in the first version of the speech, it was the military industrial congressional complex, which I think is interesting because um, I'm dear friends. Well, I like to say I'm dear friends with Ray McGovern. We call him Grandpa Ray, um, uh, but he, he calls it Mickey Matt. Um, so it's the Ray military. The, 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 the military the, industrial uh, complex. Yeah. So he calls yeah, it yeah. Matt and it's the military industrial congressional intelligence media academia think tank. <sighs> yes. Yeah. And for people who don't know, Ray right. spent decades briefing presidents. I mean, yes. he was like at the top of the intelligence apparatus. He's kind of like Daniel Ellsberg. He is. Someone who was right at the top of this and machine. Bill Benny. Shout out to Bill Benny, also another amazing whistleblower. Huge. Yeah. Big, big respect for each of them. I would love if I can just to shout out, Jesse mentioned his name, uh, one of my former clients, uh, Leonard Peltier. Uh, Peltier. I didn't so, know he was a client of yours. I mean, I just learned something new about way. you. The, there was a partner at the law firm that I worked at for two years when I first left law school <clears throat> who'd met Leonard when they were much younger and he had been his principal lawyer for years. And so I helped prepare. Uh, it, was a, it was a parole hearing in 2003 or 2004. Mm -hmm. So I had a very limited engagement there and I left the law firm not long after to join the public interest arena. But yeah, among my, you know, my, my legal practice career, I look back on, you know, I was only a litigator for two years, but I had some of the best cases I could fathom. You know, I, I, I lucked into the firm gave me a chance to represent two members of Congress who co-sponsored the last time Congress tried to take money out of politics. And we won that appeal before the DC circuit. This is Shays versus FEC, the Federal Election Commission. And we were fighting to preserve the <clears throat> widely known as McCain-Feingold, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2003. We were defending it from the FEC undermining it through the regulations. We won that case four years before the Supreme Court destroyed it in the Citizens United decision.
Mm. So like I, I had a chance to defend campaign finance reform at a sort of high watermark. And then I brought to the firm the second case in the country asserting the right of consenting adults to marry a partner of their choice. And my client in that case, Jason West, he was a Green Party mayor of a small town in upstate New York, New Paltz. He was the only official in the country who ever faced criminal prosecution for supporting LGBT communities. And we lost the cases as we knew we would, but we won the war many years later, first in the New York State Legislature in 2011, and then the Oberfeld decision a few years after that. And you know, I uh, and and then the other thing I got a chance to do was try to get Leonard out of prison. And so, you know, to have two years in private practice and that was my docket, I frankly felt, you know, I got a very lucky experience as a young litigator. Um, yeah, Leonard Leonard Peltier or Peltier, how, however you choose to pronounce it. He was my introduction in fifth grade, believe it or not, into politics, if you will, into okay. finding out what really, the real history of things. And it was through the Rage Against the Machine video, Freedom, which <laughs> uses yes. clip, it uses clips from uh, Robert and Redford's Rage Against documentary. The Machine got a lot of people our age into politics. Yes. I really do. I mean, for me, it was public Thanks, enemy. Zach. But... Thanks, Zach. Yeah. I feel the same way about Chuck D. And the fact yeah. that they now collaborate, I think is just, yes. I'm yeah. Pleased. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you've seen the video, then you know it uses clips from uh, Robert Redford's documentary, Incident at Oglala, which I also recommend watching. It's about what happened uh, at Pine Ridge that uh, got Leonard uh, imprisoned, um, even though I believe he is innocent, and mm -hmm. so do lots of people. Um, but yeah, then... I think from there, I started to learn about so many political prisoners uh, whom I'm sure you know, and that's another hideous yeah. uh, aspect of our prison system. How many political prisoners are actually in there? Um, you know, we started with Julian Assange. So I think that's sort of a relevant point that, he's um, he's yeah, he's leader. a political prisoner and, and the no U.S. Question. Yeah, the U.S. has so many um, Mumia but, all comes to mind. Yeah. If I could shout one out in San Francisco, who's going through uh, something like this now, Malik Washington is an editor of a national black newspaper, the SF Bayview. He, as an incarcerated person living in a halfway house, exposed, he wrote a story about a COVID outbreak in a private prison, which then retaliated against him. Uh, and, you know, at that point, you sort of, even if there were other things that might have uh, landed you in the institution, when you're being retaliated against for exposing the truth, that makes you a political prisoner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it fits also with this crackdown on the press because he's, he's a prisoner who's being retaliated against based on his activities as a journalist. And so I just want to shout out Malik, in addition to the other political prisoners that you're- Is he currently uh, incarcerated or did you say he's currently going through the court? He's, a, he's in a halfway house. Oh, okay. Uh, so sort of like quasi-incarceration. Yeah. He's, he's able to leave in order to go to the office and work, but then has to report back. Yeah, shout out to Jeremy so, Hammond, who just got out of his halfway house and is now um, free of that part of his, he still has two years of parole, I think, but at least he's out of the halfway yeah. house. The and uh, let's not forget oh, about that? Daniel she, she, Hale. Oh yeah, Daniel Hale. I was, was going to say, Daniel Hale, who exposed so much about the drone assassination program, uh, he's facing- Now being railroaded. Uh, jail, jail time right now. Um, I mean, he's been facing it for a while, but uh, they're starting to- clamp the vice down on him so um let's not forget him but the list is so long mm -hmm. and uh shahid uh we don't want to keep you too long and i think we've we've exercised um a lot of topics here but i'd love to have you back one, though i find you one, fascinating so one thing i'd like to ask you about before we let you go is your stance on palestine israel and bds yes because uh and i and i ask this because not just is it important in so many ways but when AOC uh, was elected and was interviewed by Margaret Hoover on PBS, I think it was Firing Line, the name of the program, something like that. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. But she was asked about her support for uh, Palestinian human rights and her support for uh, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And she just totally backtracked and fumbled and, and gave up on that which was something that was that she was outspoken about, very outspoken about. Did you see the interview campaign. today, Jesse? She gave a, another interview today and it's like a word salad 
I don't even know what she's trying to say, the why and the when and the it's. it's I haven't seen that. Okay, yet. you should go watch it. I when you started asking that question, I was wondering if that's what, if that's what you were going to be talking about. But it's it's a really specifically weird. about Palestine. That's what she was asked about. Yeah, she was asked about the quote unquote two state solution and what she th and the, she didn't really answer the question. And it was very much just like this weird. I don't even know. It was it's a very strange answer. And she didn't answer. Basically, it's a non answer. It's a politician answer. So yeah, I'm definitely interested just, to hear so, your position on that though. So I've, I've been to the West Bank and I've talked to people, particularly Christian Palestinians who explained to me how they had been subjected to settler violence. And it's presented in the West as if it's a religious conflict between Jews and Muslims when it's basically a land grab. Mm -hmm. It's settler colonialism, just like South Africa, just like the US at one point. It's not... Uh, in any way ironic that the U.S. is Israel's principal defender in the international arena. It is the other country that's gotten away with that degree of displacement. Mm -hmm. Now, when I look at Palestine and the different, Misty brought this up earlier, there's an intersection here because the IDF, I have a whole song about this. Ferguson to Jerusalem is a tech house track I produced in 2017. There's a whole verse about the relationship between U.S. support for Israel's security forces and the way Americans end up dead at the end of it. Every time you hear about an unarmed person who's shot like 50 times or some absurd number of times, that's IDF counterinsurgency training. It used to be in the United States, if a cop shot you, maybe they'd fire once or twice, but they wouldn't keep shooting until the body stopped moving. That's counterinsurgency training. That's the knee on the, the neck. IDF. That's very IDF. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we can't even pretend that this is just a foreign policy issue. This is like human rights abuse laundering, ultimately. And I'm very, and there's another piece to think about here. When we think about BDS specifically domestically, one way it's become a flashpoint is by many states passing laws to try to criminalize mm -hmm. quintessential First Amendment constitutionally protected behavior. The right to participate in a boycott is uncontroversially constitutional. There's no way someone can force you to buy things from someone. And if a community decides that it wants to divest from a particular say a fossil fuel company or a foreign government in order to defend human rights, that's perfectly legitimate. Not only is it perfectly legitimate, we should be doing those things. Mm -hmm. Sanctions is another level, right? So boycotts are things that private individuals can do. You know, divestments are things that governments and pension funds and institutional actors can do. Sanctions is a uniquely government position. And I think of sanctions as a human rights abuse. So I'm pro-boycott, I'm pro-divestment, I'm anti-sanction. Well, I'm... I'm speaking of sanctions in terms of weaponry, the weaponry we send yes. them and the military. We be supplying weapons to no foreign power that abuses human rights. And that's not, not just Israel. I'm that's not talking about denying Israeli people food or necessities. I'm talking about. I think that's a good distinction ending, to make, though, because sanctions ending all generally weapons. mean economic. And that is always the people are hurt by that. But I agree with you, Jesse. We, and I mean, both of you, we should not be sending weapons to anyone who is, and I mean, actually, but we're, we're committing human rights abuses. So what do we it's care? It's actually illegal under U.S. law for the U.S. to be sending weapons to Israel because they have this just ghastly track record of harming and killing children using American weaponry. And that's illegal under American law. Uh, but one reason goes it on. One reason it goes on is because there's no one to call it out. You know, the mm -hmm. press doesn't do it. And Congress, which has an oversight rule, is asleep at the switch in ways we've described. So, you know, when I want to bring maybe this full circle, the, the conversation we had around press freedom and the prosecution of journalists, as well as the sort of conversation about the viability or possibility through electoral politics to do anything useful, you know, I, I see them fused, particularly through the oversight power, because one of the ways that the public can learn about things, not just through the press, but from members of Congress who fight executive secrecy. And I do think that uh, not just fighting executive secrecy, but fighting executive efforts to criminalize transparency as we're doing with, with, with Julian or Chelsea or Edward Snowden or William Binney or any of the other whistleblowers or you know, people who've unfortunately ended up in prison because of things that they said. Um, I do think that this moment in history is a crucial one because we have in the very recent past, managed to kick out of the White House the obvious fascist, and now there is a subtly different and ultimately very similar figure in the White House. And our political culture has the opportunity to either maintain that resistance that everyone was so excited about, 
or go back to brunch. And on the one hand, the pandemic has kept people from going to brunch literally. I do hope that as we get to another point and people can gather again, that we start gathering not just to hug each other and enjoy each other's company, but we gather to shut things down. And you know, my first political act was shutting down a Lockheed Martin facility in 2003, right after the invasion of Iraq. And I, if that happened in more places, if more people were active in that way, I frankly think we'd see the voices that we already have in Congress show up differently. And I think we'd see a lot, a lot of new faces in some of those seats. And I'm very eager to make sure uh, that Nancy Pelosi's career and dynasty, hopefully, uh, do not survive another congressional session. We need to put an end to the co-optation of San Francisco's voice in Congress. And we need to embolden Congress to show up for work, fight the executive branch as it's constitutionally constructed to do, and promote the interests of we the people of the United States instead of Wall Street and the Pentagon. Yeah. Well, and as pertains Congress, I think you're much more optimistic than I am, but I'm, <laughs> I, I don't say that in a, a, a denigrating way. It's a difference way. of opinion. Um, and, and I think besides that, we agree on pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. And it's very heartening to, to speak with someone like yourself who's... Um, you know, working within the system, but really, you know, your views would be considered, and I think maybe fairly so, and my views too, and Misty's as well, revolutionary. And if you're going to bring something to this, to this dying government, to this dying empire, then it's got to be revolutionary, some sort of revolutionary change, which doesn't mean violence, you know, shutting down a Lockheed Martin uh, facility. That's, that's huge. That shows what people can do in numbers against this monolith of death, basically. So yeah, um, I don't support yeah, electoral I, politics. I don't really generally support politicians. There are only a handful. You're one of them. Um, uh, you know, there, and I think it's because I, I don't trust politicians. And I told Christine Olivio the same thing. She's another politician I happen to enjoy. Um, I, I don't, I will never trust you as a politician. I may like you as a person, but I will always give you the side eye. Good, um, good. But I, exactly I, what you're supposed to do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Because I get a lot of shit for doing that. But um, no, I think that just you're coming from a background of activism um, makes me feel more comfortable with you. Christine's also an activist. I think that's why I gravitate more towards Cori Bush than I do anybody else from the squad because she's an activist. Um, so I hope that she keeps that spirit. Um, and I, listen, I would be super thrilled to see Nancy Pelosi lose. It would, I would have a one woman party in my living room. Like it would be amazing. That would be one of the best things <laughs> that could happen. Um, Just dance around and eat ice cream. Yeah. Yes. That's exactly <laughs> what I, I would eat. Jenny's ice cream and dance around. Yes. Um, I would say I would do that, but I don't think I can afford Jenny's ice cream. Right. <laughs> I'll get cheaper ice cream and dance around. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so like uh, Ben and Jerry's because they're, they're nice leftist boys. We like them. Um, yeah. So uh, I appreciate your career, really your career in activism. I appreciate you taking on Nancy Pelosi. Um, I think your work is valuable and I'm grateful to you for doing it. So uh, yeah, I just appreciate your work and I'm thankful for you for coming onto the show. Um, do you want to tell everybody where they can find you um, online, all the Twitters and all that good stuff so people can follow your work and keep up, up to date on whether or not you decide to run again? Sure, Misty. Thank you for, for that invitation. Uh, folks can find out more about my work, background, and future plans at shahidforchange.us. And we're active on all the social media networks, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Clubhouse recently, YouTube at Shahid for Change. And I really appreciate you bringing me on. I've uh, appreciated your voice online. And yeah, great to connect with you. I look forward to speaking with you again. Yeah, yeah. it was great to meet you, Shahid. Thank it you really so was. much for, for joining us and being generous with your time. And I think we had a really productive conversation. And um, I hope we can, we can speak again in the future. Right on, for sure. I'd love that.